Welcome back! In this second installment of our tutorial series on microservices, we're excited to explore the model view controller design pattern. Today, we'll implement the first iteration of our very own microservice. Specifically, we'll be developing a Spring Boot Java service that provides RESTful APIs to interact with the database we set up in Part 1, hosted in a Docker container. And to ensure our service is robust and reliable, We'll utilize Makito and JUnit to achieve 100% unit test coverage. Ready to get started? Let's kick off this second microservice tutorial with basics, and I mean the very basics of an application, where a user interacts with a monolithic application to get data from a database so they could make an informed decision. The user takes an action, the application retrieves the appropriate data and present them to the user. Basics. Well, Today, this monolithic design no longer works because of the connected nature of our world. In fact, our predecessors already knew this design will not scale. And so, they smartly decided to organize an application into different layers that were not so tightly coupled with a presentation layer, a data and business logic layer, and a translator layer in between, effectively creating what we know today as the model view controller design pattern. Let's discuss briefly each layer of this design pattern, starting with the model. The model represents the data structure and the business logic. It manages the data, interacting with the database or other data sources, and it also enforces the business rules of the application. On the other hand, the view or presentation layer renders the model's data for the user. In a full stack application, the view is responsible to send the user actions, click on a button, for example, to the controller layer. But in a back end service, the view is the data representation sent back to the client. Finally, the controller or translator layer receives and processes incoming requests. The controller primary job is to coordinate between the model and view. It also contains the logic to handle requests, which doesn't mean it owns the business rules. These are owned by the model. Oh, fun fact, the MVC pattern was first introduced in 1979. So, it's been around the block. Let's now dive further into how the MVC pattern works. First, the user interacts with the UI, such as clicking a button or submitting a form, which is then routed to the running application. The controller receives the request and processes it, by extracting data from the request and determining which models to interact with. The model then retrieves or updates data from the database, applies the relevant business rules, performing any necessary data transformations, before returning the processed data to the controller. The controller then provides the data for the view layer to present them to the user in the expected format, effectively updating the UI for the user. This particular flow is applicable to full stack application, because the interactions between layers is slightly different when it comes to application or service that are only back end. So, let's look at these differences. With back end services, the users are other applications or services that send requests to an endpoint of our service which are routed to the controller without going through the view. The controller parses and validates the incoming request and interacts with the model to handle the received request. The model performs data operations, applies business rules and validations, and returns the processed data to the controller. The controller then works with the view to format the processed data in a desired response format before sending the response back to the client. So as you can see, the interactions between layers are slightly different, but the role and responsibility of each layer remains the same. Now that we understand what the MVC design pattern is, let's start developing our first microservice. And the initial step is to select a programming language. And for this tutorial, we'll pick Java. To be more precise, we're going to leverage the Spring framework. So, what it is? Well, the Spring Framework is a comprehensive, modular Java framework that provides infrastructure support for developing a wide range of Java applications, from small projects to large-scale enterprise systems. Let's start with the Data Access and Integration module which simplifies database operations, ORM integration, XML marshalling, messaging, and transaction management. The Web module provides robust support for web application development, including Spring MVC and integration with various web technologies. The core container forms the foundation of the Spring framework, managing beans, dependency injection, and application context. The aspect-oriented programming, or AOP, 
Enable separation of cross-cutting concerns through method interception and point cuts. The instrumentation module supports class instrumentation and class loader implementations for certain application servers. And then the test module facilitates comprehensive testing of Spring components with support for popular testing frameworks, like Junit, Makito, PowerMock. Overall, the Spring framework modules provide developers with a powerful set of tools to build robust, scalable, and maintainable enterprise applications. The modular architecture of the Spring framework allows developers to select only the necessary modules for their specific needs, reducing unnecessary overhead and complexity in the application. All right, enough said, let's now wear our engineering hat and start coding. Okay, let's not waste any time, and let's install the prerequisite. First, we need to install download and install GitHub Desktop if you haven't done it yet. All the code you need to go through that second exercise is indeed available via GitHub. We'll then download and install IntelliJ, which we'll use to develop and build our Java Spring Boot application. And then, we'll download and install Postman, a great tool that will help us validate the RESTful APIs of our microservice. And, like last time, don't you worry, all the links are listed in the video description. Okay, now, please, pause the video, proceed with the installations, and I'll see you right after. Okay, welcome back, as we did last time, let's start GitHub Desktop, and get ready to clone the Docker IAM SRVP2 repository, as shown here. Again, the link to the GitHub repo is provided in the video description. Now that you've cloned the repo, let's briefly look at what we have downloaded. As you can see, the repo includes both a main and a test folder. But, let's first look at the main folder, which includes a resource subfolder where you define your application properties, and then as you dive into the main folder, you can find a few more subfolders containing various classes. And yes, we're going to double click on these main folders. Let's go back to our MVC design pattern. In this example, the model is implemented through three set of folders. The payload which defines the request and response objects are microservice and clients used to communicate. And then, the constant and enums are, to simplify, supporting classes that provide a common dictionary for our service and its clients to engage in meaningful interactions. Easy, right? We then move to the controller, which is implemented in the controller folder, what a surprise. In the first iteration of our service, the permission controller class handles all the requests specific to the permission business object, including the get, post, patch and del requests. As I mentioned earlier, with the exception of validating the received payload information, the permission controller delegates all advanced management of requests to the model and the permission service class. So, let's double click on the classes belonging to the model. The model handles both the business logic and the data layer. The business logic is implemented within the service classes, such as the permission service which works with the permission controller as we've seen. Then we have the actual data model with the business objects and the data transfer objects or DTO. The DTO objects map directly, or one-to-one -to, -one to a table defined in the database schema. Next is our manager classes which handle the database connections and transactions, and the repository classes that handle the low-level database operations. The create, the read, the update and the delete operations. Now, let's at how all these different classes interact together to response to a user request. Let's start with a user requesting the information about a permission 123. The request is routed to the permission controller which delegates it to the permission service. The permission service asks the permission manager to get the requested permission. The permission manager works with the permission repository to retrieve from the database the permission of ID equals to 123. The permission repository instantiates a permission DTO object and passes it to the permission manager, which translates it into a permission business object. The permission service then translates it into a payload the client will understand, passing the response back to the controller so that the controller can send back the appropriate response to the client. And guess what? This is what we're going to do now. Okay, 
Now that you understand the structure and relationship of classes in our project, let's open it with IntelliJ and build it. To build it, navigate to the Maven Build option, select I am Service Project and Lifecycle submenu. Then, right click on the Compile option and wait. Wait a few seconds until the build is successful. Let's take a small step back and talk about networking. Docker networking allows containers to communicate with each other in the outside world. It provides several network drivers, including bridge, host, overlay, and Mac VLAN, each serving different use cases. Without diving much into all these concepts, let me at least provide you a 50,000 feet view of the bridge and custom networks so that you understand what we're going to do next. First, when you run a container on a host machine, this container leverages the host networking to connect to the external world. You can also expose that Docker to the world via the host machine. This is what we did in part one when we expose the socket 3306 so that we can connect and query our MySQL database. And the same applies to all Dockers running on the same host. Let's now introduce the, the bridge network, which is the most common and default network created automatically when you deploy a container. The bridge network uses a software bridge that allows containers running on the same host to communicate using IP addresses. But in our example, we're going to go one step further by creating a custom network that will enable better isolation between the containers of our first microservice. Simple, right? So let's go back to our first Docker image, the Docker IMDB, and create our custom network that we're going to name IAM Service Network. The steps are simple and documented in the readme of our first code sample. And don't worry, you'll find the link in the video description. Anyway, long story short, following the video, you first create the network and then run your container specifying to the network it should belong to. And we're done and ready to go to the next step, testing the our service. Thus far, we've built our microservice and kicked off the Docker container hosting our database. It's now time to test if our microservice works as expected. As you've probably noticed, our sample project includes a set of unit tests. Some of these tests leverage Makito while others are end-to-end -end tests, in which we exercise the complete flow of the application, reading data from our database, and writing data back. Anyway, let's run our unit tests, and let's make sure to calculate the code coverage of our tests too. There are a total of 350 unit tests, as you can see in the video. It takes about 30 to 40 seconds to run them. The unit tests provide 100% code coverage, which is ideal, but not realistic in the real world. Okay, now that all works as expected, let's package our service. Similar to what we did to build the service, let's install it, selecting the Install Compilation option. This option will not only build and package the service, but it'll also run all our unit tests again. So it may take a couple of minutes. Just be patient. and it's done, you end up with a fully compiled and ready to deploy jar file of our microservice. Which lead us to our next step. Our next step is to containerize our service. This means creating a Docker image which starts with a slim JDK image, to which we add the jar file of our microservice. The rest is exactly the same as we did in part one. First, we create the image. Easy, right?
and once the image is created, we simply run the container. Again, don't worry about the commands to type, they are all described in the readme of our microservice. What's next? Well, we need to test it. To test our microservice, we're going to use Postman. First, import the Postman collection you'll find in the root folder of our microservice. And then, try the get request to the root of our service. You should get a no content found because, we don't want people to hit our service randomly, right? So, let's try instead to get all the permission records. Again, since we haven't inserted any, there's no data to found. Third, let's insert a permission record via a post command. You can then try to request the created permission, specifying the right identifier. And you can delete it as well. Long story short, we successfully validated our microservice. Nicely done. Okay, to wrap up this demo, let's recap what we did on our local host machine. We run the container hosting our database. We then built, unit tested and containerized our microservice. We ensured that both containers were able to communicate via our custom network. And we tested our application, simulating clients calling our microservice via Postman. Congratulations, this is the end of our second tutorial. All right, this is it for today, but there's more coming. Indeed, in the third installment of our tutorial series on microservices, we're going to take step back from implementation to explore the fundamentals of microservices. We'll discuss what microservices are, the benefits of adopting this architecture, and compare it to a monolithic solution. Additionally, we'll address common mistakes organizations make when transitioning to a microservices architecture. That said, before moving on, don't forget to implement the missing management features of our initial iteration of our first microservice. Oh, one more thing. Don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to get notified when the next tutorial is published. Thank you, and see you very soon.